Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us at the Microsoft Power BI UK user group. I'm your host, Leon Gordon, and we're back for another session where we come together as a community to learn more about Power BI and the Microsoft data platform. So as always, uh, I'd like to thank you for, first and foremost for joining us. The Q&A is now open, so please do let us know where you're dialing in from, um, whether you're in sunny UK, uh, I can actually say that for the first time in, in months now, or whether you're overseas. I would love to hear where you're where you're joining us in from. OK, so with that being said, um, today's session um, is on integrating Power BI with Azure Synapse Analytics with Microsoft MVP Andy Cutler. So Andy is a is an Azure data platform professional working predominantly with Azure Synapse Analytics. So this is SQL pools, Data Factory, SQL Server and Power BI. He holds an MSc in business intelligence and data mining. And as I mentioned, he's also a current Microsoft data platform uh, MVP. Now, funnily, just before I hand over to, to Andy, we've actually realised that we're also pretty much neighbours. So whilst we didn't take the opportunity today to do this face, face to face and side by side, um, hopefully we can do that in the future. So without any further ado, I'll hand you over to Andy. Hello there. Well, I hope you can hear me OK. And, uh, and yes, I, I was under the impression that MVPs were like, uh, unless you were in person at events, um, you were like nomads, you know, you were never too, you know, you were you were far away from all other MVPs, but Leon's just around the corner. So I think there's some uh, some good opportunities there. But anyway, firstly, Leon, thank you for uh, for inviting me on to the uh, the Power BI UK user group. Now, the session title is Integrating Power BI with Azure Synapse Analytics. OK, now in this session, I'm not going to go through the process of how Synapse Analytics and Power BI work in terms of Synapse Studio, OK, in terms of working with Power BI in Synapse there. I'm more going to be looking at how, firstly, how we simply connect to Synapse Analytics from Power BI desktop, because there's a couple of options available. Then we're going to look at some of the features, OK? So I'm just kind of setting the scene there. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Andy Cutler. I'm not going to go into too much detail because Leon gave me a fantastic <laughs> introduction there. If you scan the QR code, that will take you to my Twitter page. Um, so I have lots of discussions, uh, mostly around Synapse Analytics, serverless SQL pools. Please feel free to ask me any questions on Twitter as well, because I'm more than happy uh, to go into any detail around anything that I'm covering, um, mostly around Synapse Analytics, data warehousing in general, and uh, you know I have an eye on on other technologies as well, um, other cloud data warehouse platforms as well. So, you know, please, you know, if you want to uh, scan that and follow me, that would be fantastic. And my blogs are down there as well. ServerlessSQL.com is where I blog the most around Synapse Analytics. So with Azure Synapse Analytics, um, actually there should be um, an introduction slide to this deck. It doesn't see, it seems to have skipped straight into Azure Synapse Analytics. Okay, not a problem. That was the first slide anyway. Essentially with Azure Synapse Analytics, you've probably seen this slide before probably seen this graphic before okay because synapse analytics is several services all rolled up into one platform we're going to be concentrating on two of those services today which is the dedicated sql pools so up there in that graphic you can see sql okay next to apache spark next to data explorer okay so within that SQL area, there are two pools that we could use. We've got dedicated SQL pools, okay? Now this used to be, about five or six years ago, called Azure SQL Data Warehouse, or it was, you know, it was provisioned about five or six years ago. A Couple of years ago, it was rebranded and renamed into dedicated SQL pools, but it's for running your SQL Data Warehousing workloads, okay? It's an MPP, architecture, massively parallel processing, where we're looking to import data into a database structure itself. And we've got 
common data warehousing indexing strategies there on tables when we import data. We've got column store indexing and regular clustered indexes as well. On the serverless SQL pool side, so this was a new service that was um, deployed when Microsoft rebranded Synapse Analytics. And essentially, again, we're running SQL workloads, but this time we're running SQL workloads on external data. There is no data stored within serverless SQL pools itself. We're connecting to Azure Storage, Data Lake Gen 1, Data Lake Gen 2, Cosmos DB and the Dataverse. So we have an opportunity to expose Dynamics data, for example. But we're using tried and tested T-SQL commands over that data without moving that data into different places. OK. So those two pools, the dedicated and the serverless, are what we're going to be looking at today. So in terms of connecting, to Synapse Analytics. In desktop, there are two connectors and when creating data flows, two connectors. OK, we've got Azure Synapse Analytics SQL, sorry, Synapse and Azure Synapse Analytics Workspace Beta. So what are the differences between the two and when should you use each one? OK, well, the Azure Synapse, Synapse Analytics SQL is the original one. That's that's the connector that's been around for, you know, since Synapse uh, has existed. OK, this lets you put a server name, which is the SQL endpoint of the dedicated SQL pool. OK, you don't have to choose a database. You can select the database in the next uh, the next window, but you can import or direct query connect to that dedicated SQL pool. OK, so you, you're flexible on that connector. The new connector that's in beta, now it's flexible in terms of when you use it to connect, it's going to display a list of Synapse Analytics workspaces that you can connect to. So as you can see here, I've got four Synapse workspaces there. I've expanded my Synapse UK and I've got a series of databases which include both the dedicated and the serverless. OK, so it's all in one screen. The issue is it's import only, so there is no direct query or live connection to Synapse through that workspace connector at the moment. So in terms of the features. When we're looking at Synapse and Power BI, there are features in Synapse that will help Power BI. And there are features in Power BI that will help Synapse as well. So on the Synapse Analytics side, OK, I've got three sort of main areas that, to look at. OK, we've got materialized views. OK, so what this allows us to do is create a stored view of data. And this is primarily useful if you've got some heavy computation that is being done in a query and you're generating a data set. That data set is required for Power BI. Creating a materialized view could be a good way of number one, creating that view once. So just running that running that view definition once as the data in the base tables is being changed. Synapse will be updating that materialized view. So all you need to do is just connect to and refresh. OK, and the materialized view is the demo that we'll see later on. We'll go into a little bit more detail there. Number two is result set caching. Now <clears throat> it's off by default. When you switch this on and it's on a database level, OK, so if you've got one single dedicated SQL pool, you can switch that result set caching on or off. And what it'll do is when a query comes in. And it generates the data for it. If it is of a sufficient size, so I think it is uh, somewhere in the region of uh, less than 10 gig, it will cache those results. OK, if the same SQL query comes in. 
to dedicated SQL pools and the data hasn't changed, Synapse will serve the cache. Now, there's a slide on concurrency with dedicated SQL pools, but what I want to mention here is that one of the benefits of result set caching is it does not use up any of your query concurrency. If Synapse can return that result set back to the calling application, SQL client, Power BI, it won't use any of the concurrency. So I'll explain concurrency in a future slide. And the last one is workload classification. With dedicated SQL pools, we can assign a user, so that can be an Active Directory user or a SQL user, we can assign uh, that user to a resource class. And essentially, that resource class dictates how much resource is given to that user when running a query. Okay, so we've got some concepts of some static resource classes and uh, dynamic resource classes. So for example, I could be a user, I log into dedicated SQL pools, but my resource class is set to small. So for example, I would only get 5% of the entire dedicated SQL pool resource to run my query. And now with workload classification, what this means is that I can actually classify when a query comes in, what importance to give it, okay? So this is important in terms of data loading and then reporting, okay? So you could see situations where when you wanna load data into Synapse, you might decide that that is the most important thing that needs to happen. You can set workload classification for the, the data importing to be much more important than reading the data or the other way around. And of course, you can set this during Windows as well. So loading data could be more important overnight. During the day, querying can be more important. For example, the user that is loading Power BI data sets could be given a higher workload importance. On the Power BI side, aggregations, okay? Now, we've got manual and automatic. I wanted to call the two things out separately rather than just putting aggregations, okay? So with aggregations, um, we are looking to do some importing of an aggregated data set to essentially allow Power BI to serve the results back of those aggregations a lot quicker. If there's some more detail to be uh, to be returned that isn't part of the aggregations, that will fall back to direct query. And if it's connected to Synapse Analytics, it will fall back to a view or a table that uh, the Power BI is connected to. But you have to set those aggregations manually. So you have to understand your workload, understand the aggregations that are being used most frequently and create them. With automatic aggregations, so there are only, I think, four supported data sources at the moment. So dedicated uh, SQL pools is part of that. Uh, serverless isn't supported yet. And essentially, connected in direct query to Synapse from Power BI. If you enable automatic aggregations and set a threshold, okay, which is a percentage of the number of queries that you want to be to look for in terms of aggregations, what Power BI will do is it'll analyze that workload and it'll see what aggregations it can create automatically based on user activity within Power BI, within the report itself, and apply those aggregations. We've got incremental refresh. Now, probably one of the most important things with dealing with Power BI and Synapse Analytics is probably incremental refresh because you know the reason that we're using Synapse Analytics is because of the volume of data. We really don't want to have to load those tens of millions, hundreds of millions, well, billions uh, as well we're dealing with in Power BI. We don't want to have to load those uh, every time we refresh a data set. Yeah, we want to do an initial load and then every day, whatever the frequency, is load those incremental 
uh, data sets. And then there's the more advanced incremental refresh, which is the hybrid tables. OK, so that's where we have import and direct query. So direct query for your latest hot data and import for your archive data. And I have seen uh, some some discussions around flipping that round and using direct query for older data and import for the hot data as well. OK, but essentially you're able to configure both import and direct query on a single table. Now you can mix and match. Yeah, so it's entirely possible to use incremental refresh over a materialized view or aggregations over a materialized view. Yeah, uh, set your workloads to higher importance for Power BI when it's refreshing. OK, but those are the, the, the sort of high level features that I wanted to call out. Now with dedicated SQL pools, I touched on the concept of concurrency. And that is tied, well, it's tied to a couple of things really. So number one, we've got the DWUs, the data warehouse units, okay? This is the tier of service that you can set a dedicated SQL pool at, okay? So I've got some examples that I'll show in a minute, okay? Now, the lowest level is DWU 100, and this goes all the way up to about 30,000. Quite big. So that's number one. You are constrained by the number of queries that you can run at the same time. At a specific compute tier. Number two, as we said, with workload um, management and importance, a user can be assigned a resource class, OK? And essentially that resource class is assigned a certain percentage of resources in Synapse Analytics. So for example, what I'll do is I'll bring DWU 100C up, which allows you to run four queries concurrently, OK? That doesn't mean that if a fifth query comes in, it's going to reject that fifth query. It will queue the queries up. Yep. And it will just hopefully blaze through those queries. Um, but you can only run four at the same time at the lowest level DWU 100. OK. However, if there was a resource class being used, uh, let's say uh, one of the larger resource classes that takes up, um, let's say, 70 percent of the synapse, uh, the dedicated pool resource, right? You wouldn't be able to run four of those resource class users at the same time. You'd be able to run one large resource class and probably a small resource class as well before you started hitting both the concurrency and the resource class limits. So as an example, we look and we can see that it starts to scale linearly. Yeah, the next DWU tier up gives us eight queries concurrently. 500 gives us 20. And then it sort of stops scaling linearly from there on. OK, so DWU 1000 gives you 32 queries concurrently. And lastly, 30,000 gives you 128 queries that you can run concurrently. And there are the RAM limits at the bottom. OK, so as you can see, you know, we've got RAM. 60 gig of RAM for DWU 100. So if a user was uh, assigned to a, a small resource class, um, they'll be given a certain amount of that RAM to uh, to run queries. So with serverless SQL pools, slightly different. Number one, they're always on. OK, so when you log into Synapse Analytics, you will see that inbuilt service. That's the SQL, that's the serverless SQL pools engine. That's always running. Yeah, you don't resume it. You don't pause it. You don't stop it like you can do with dedicated SQL pools. You don't scale serverless SQL pools. There is nothing to configure in terms of uh, compute tier, number of nodes, nothing. OK, it will allocate the resources according to the query. But there are some best practices around, OK, and 
if you go to any um, talk around serverless SQL pools, um, by and large, you know, you'll probably be presented with the same best practices because uh, serverless SQL pools is to some extent or to a lot of an extent relying on the external data to be optimized for best performance. We can help serverless SQL pools out as well. So some of the best practices are around the file types that you're dealing with. OK, yes, serverless SQL pools can connect to delimited data, CSV, uh, nested data like JSON and Parquet data, which is a, a column based uh, storage format, file format, where both the data and the schema and statistics are stored in the file itself. A okay, very fast, very compressed method of storing data uh, in a data lake. We've got tips like assigning the smallest data types possible, okay? Because when serverless SQL pools run a runs a query, it will allocate the resources required to run that query, and it'll look at the data types. It'll infer data types as well if it doesn't know what those data types are. As you can imagine, the inferred data types are probably a lot larger than you may need. And we've got a, uh, an even, evenly sized uh, number of files. Andy, so just how... on that note, I hope you don't mind if I just jump in with a quick yeah. uh, question. So this comes in from Fernando. Um, Fernando asks, uh, with serverless SQL pools, uh, would, would they have to be more expensive? Is he correct in thinking that? Serverless SQL more expensive than dedicated, for example. Yes, yes. Correct. Okay, so this is all going to depend on how much data that you're processing. Okay, so with serverless SQL pools, the way that you're being charged is how much data you're processing. And when I say processing, I mean selecting, reading from the external sources, and also writing. So you can write data back to the data lake using a process called uh, CTAS, create external table as select. Uh, it's a very basic implementation of writing data back and it's useful in some simple scenarios. But ultimately, you're being charged for the amount of data that you're processing. So not on how long the query takes or how uh, or, or the resources required other than the data processed. So it's around uh, $5 per one terabyte processed okay so you can imagine if on a daily basis you need to process uh, or read a terabyte of data okay and ultimately let's say you were aggregating and landing that data in power bi if you ran it once every day it cost you uh five dollars times 30 days a hundred and hundred and fifty dollars um so yeah when i go through the Power BI demo uh, later with serverless SQL pools. That and it's a really great question to ask at this stage because watch out for that. I will uh, raise the attention of data processed. Yeah, because that's how you're being charged. Excellent. Thank you very much, Andy. OK. Thank you for that. Yeah, so <clears throat> how does how can serverless SQL pools help Power BI if you're using serverless to query data from a data lake? OK, because. One of the things that we can make use of is a, a SQL function, so it's a SQL function that you can use when you're selecting data uh, called file path. There is another one called file name, which I'll leave out of out of the session. But essentially what file path does is it returns the folder, literally the value of the folder at the specified location. So in this example, we've got a data lake. Yep, so data lake Gen 2, and we've got a nested folder structure, which is you know a very, very common hive partitioning strategy where we have year, month, date. We could go on, we could have hour, minute, etc. We've got a three, uh, a three folder uh, hierarchy where our 
data is stored. Now in serverless SQL pools, what we can do is we can create a view, okay? We don't have to create a view to use the file path function, okay? But as we see later on, it's very useful to create a view in serverless SQL pools because it will abstract the connection to the data lake away from any users query in that view. But as you can see here, I've added three, oops, I've added three file path um, functions, <clears throat> one, two, and three. So essentially, if you see on the left hand side on the data lake, event date is the third level in the folder hierarchy. OK, so when I select file path one, file path two and file path three, essentially what I'm asking serverless to retrieve is the value of the folder. Yeah, so it will show event year 2022, event month 03, event day equals such and such in a column in your result set. Why do we want to do this? Right. Go back to that whole concept of data processed with serverless SQL pools. OK, you don't want to have to reread the same data over and over again. So with Power BI, what Power BI can do. All right now, this is massively simplified here in terms of a select statement. OK, but imagine filters, um, parameters, etc. Passing in a date value. That date value. Can essentially be used to only select the data from the required folder in the data lake. OK, so a couple of benefits there. So number one, it's going to reduce the amount of data that you're processing. And reduce your cost. And um, number two, performance, because if you tell serverless where your data is in the data lake, serverless can just disregard all the other folders and go to the specific folders and get the data that you need. OK, so we're going to jump into a demo now. So how are we doing for time? So we're on 26 minutes. So we're going to look at two things. So as I touched on before, we're going to look at dedicated SQL pools, materialized views. Then we're going to look at serverless SQL pools and this partition filtering. OK. So I'm going to flip to. Synapse Studio. We scroll to the top, OK? Well, what I'll do is. I'll just expand. My dedicated SQL pool, OK? So just to confirm, I'll go into manage, OK? So we've got one dedicated SQL pool database, which is currently running at DW, DW 500, OK? So that gives me. 600 gig of RAM. Go back to data. OK, and I have got some standard fact and dimension tables. OK. I've got a fact web telemetry table and I've got about 1.2 billion rows in that table. OK, that table. Is. Very simple. OK, so we're going to do accounts. Yeah, 1.2 billion. And if I do a top 10. OK. You can see we've got. Your usual surrogate keys, we've got a customer key, a product key. We've got an event date. Event type key, device key and a session view. So what this is, this is. Web telemetry data. Synthetic web telemetry data. Where users can browse a website, visit product pages on their devices and perform an action such as browsing a product, putting a product in their shopping basket, and ultimately purchasing that product as well. Okay, so that's the context for this data set that we're using. Okay, so we've got 1.2 billion rows of data. Now we could open Power BI Desktop, connect to and import right we've got 
around four gig. So that's that's the size of the data in that table. OK, and we know that Power BI can handle quite a lot, quite a lot of data. Right. However, uh, the speed of importing those uh, that 1.2 billion rows uh, might not be the best. Um, and also. We might be constrained with the size of our model when we do try and upload it to the service. OK, so it is a bit of a consideration. So what I can do. Is. Go into this concept of materialized views, right? We're going to leave that to one side. I'm just going to create a standard view, OK, where I'm going to join to those dimension tables to bring in some of those attributes. I'm going to aggregate to reduce the number of rows. So what I'll do is I'm going to run this create view statement. OK, and it's just as you can see, it's a, just a standard SQL statement. We're selecting uh, some attributes from our date dimension. Some attributes from our device dimension, our event type dimension, product uh, and some aggregates. OK, doing some inner joins and grouping, nothing out of the ordinary. OK. Now the user that I'm logged in as at the moment is assigned to a small resource class. OK. More users with smaller resource classes means higher concurrency, but the queries are probably going to run a little bit slower because of the amount of resource that's given to them. However, I'm going to select. Right, and I'm not going to let the query finish because I know that really this is uh, going to take um probably about a minute to run really okay so as you can see 13 14 15 seconds i'm just going to cancel that okay i'm going to switch to power bi okay and if we just have a very quick look at transform data okay it's all I've done is I've simply connected to that view. Nothing fancy. I zoom in there. I'm connecting to my dedicated SQL pool. And I'm connecting to that view. OK, it's in direct query as well, because one of the things that Microsoft say that materialized views are useful for is direct query. With materialized views, as I stated before, when new data becomes available in those base tables, the materialized view updates automatically. OK, but we've got to be mindful of concurrency. If I click on report. Right, I've got three visuals here. Right. And. It's already been five, six seconds. <laughs> Nobody wants that, right? So we go back to Synapse. OK, what I'll do is um, I'm going to flip to uh, an Azure Data Studio because I'm logged in to the dedicated SQL pool as another user. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to assign that user. So I'll just make sure that that user. Is not in any role. And I'm going to add them. To a resource class of X large C, which will give that user 70% of the resources. OK, so I'm going to go back to my notebook. And what I'll do is I'll run it and then zoom in. OK, so we've dropped. We've created OK, so this takes I think it takes about a minute to run. OK. <coughs> Excuse me, so the two differences from a standard view and a materialized view is that number one. We've got the keyword materialized there. Number two, we're actually having to define. Two properties, the distribution and the indexing. So the distribution essentially means how. Do I want the, the data in this view distributed? 
uh, inside dedicated SQL pools. Now, distributing data in dedicated in and of itself is a whole session, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. But suffice to say, I've got two options with materialized views. I can do what I'm doing here, which is round robin. And essentially all this does is for each row that that view is generating, it will be being put on one of the data distributions. So it will just literally a row, 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 round and round and round. I can distribute on one of those columns as well. OK. So I could say um, product key. I'm going to distribute all the data based on the product key. So what's dedicated SQL pools will do is it will group together. Those product keys that are the same and put them on a distribution. OK, now this helps with querying and data movement. Again, it's a big topic. I'm not going to go into it here. OK, so 24 seconds. OK. So we flick back to studio. OK, what I'll do is while I remember, I'm going to remove. Because I'm using the same user to connect with Power BI. I wanted to show you flicking back and forth between resource classes for for a user. OK. Now I've created that materialized view. OK, I'm going to scroll down. I can query that view directly. OK, so I've got the same query that I used before, but I've swapped it out with the materialized view. So if I run that. We get the results back pretty quickly. Get the results back in about a second. OK, however. One of the benefits with materialized views is that you don't have to query the materialized view itself. Synapse is smart enough to understand when a query comes in, if it can answer it using that materialized view. So actually you could create one materialized view, but it could be used in a whole range of different uh, applications if the data can be delivered. So we're going to use that same view here. Select the data. And we've got the results back. Same time as querying the materialized view directly. OK, so there is some there is some smartness going on there with dedicated in terms of being able to understand uh, what the query is and serving up from the materialized view uh, itself. OK, different to uh, to to result set caching because with result set caching the exact same SQL query has to hit the cache for it to be returned. OK, so what does that mean in terms of Power BI? So we'll flick back to our Power BI report now. OK, we'll hit report. And we're going to get our visuals back within one or two seconds. OK, I won't start up the uh, the performance analyzer. OK. Now this is connected in direct query. Yes. OK, but. If you were using incremental refresh over a materialized view, there would be some processing benefits there with. Um, hybrid tables, OK, if that direct query partition was querying a materialized view that was being updated with fresh data during the day, that would be available. But also in just a standard import into Power BI desktop. Yeah, if you had some computation. That needed to happen before you were loading that data in. Yeah. There are uh, and I've got links in the uh, in the PowerPoint to a Microsoft documentation around materialized views because you do have to look at the trade off. Yeah, there is some overhead in terms of those materialized views being kept up to date. Yeah, so you do have to do some analysis to see of the benefit. But you can see that the Power BI report back to being snappy based on that data. OK. So we've got enough time, so what I'll do is I'll flick back to. Studio. 
and I'm going to put my my user back into the large class. OK, and the reason I do this, by the way, is that number one, I want the user that is creating the materialized view and loading the data, which we're going to do now. I want that user to have as much resource as possible because I know that nothing else is going on on this dedicated SQL pool at the moment. OK, so I'm going to run that query. And all we're doing is we're just inserting into that fact table. From a cleansed table, I'm just spoofing the date just so that we can get the next day along. OK. One of the reasons, uh, 15 seconds, one of the reasons that I keep switching back and forth between medium and large is number one to show you the resource class switching. But also if I kept Power BI, the user that was connecting as the large resource class, the SQL that's being generated from Power BI, actually maybe only one, only one query could be run at the same time. If we go back to our reports, I'm going to refresh. And we should see. Some extra data coming in. There we go. There we go. 2.5 million on the 4th of November. So that's materialized views. As I said, there's links in the PowerPoint slide. I'll tweet that out afterwards. Uh, that'll take you to um, take you to the take you to the uh, the, the documentation. So we're going to look at serverless. OK, so I'm going to close my report. I don't need to save that. OK, I don't need my notebook anymore, so I'll just close that down. And I'll flick to my serverless folder. Now I have already set up a database OK, but I've got the code here. And we'll go through this. Reasonably quickly. We just create a database. OK, we can create schemas in that database. We encrypt with. Just put a key in there. Then we can tell serverless how we want to authenticate with our external resources. OK, so I'm using Azure Data Lake Gen 2. And I would like to use the managed identity of the Synapse workspace. Now, the managed identity is a. I'm not a security expert, but it's essentially a special user without a password that is created in your tenant specific to this resource. OK, so this entire Synapse workspace has one managed identity. I can add that managed identity to the data lake. As uh, as I would uh, a user and give it certain permissions, OK, which I've already done. OK, but I'm creating an identity. Using that managed identity, then I'm creating an external data source, which is a link, essentially just a link that I can use in my queries. To connect to the data lake, super useful so you don't have to have the full HTTP URL of the data lake. And that essentially means if I open up CSV. I've got a very simple query and I've kept the auto generated code because I'm not going to dwell too much on CSV data. Suffice to say that I have a folder that contains um, uh, nested folders. OK, I've generated some CSV data. And if I run, OK, while that's running, I've told serverless how that CSV data is formatted. OK, so I've got a header row, I've got a field terminator. And as you can see, we've got some data back. OK, now. At its most simple. I could open up Power BI desktop. I could click Synapse. I could click the Synapse connector and I could literally paste this SQL in to the SQL box and load it in. I'm not going to do that. I don't think anyone wants to see me do that. 
But you get the point. Yeah, I can just run the select statement and get some data back. If I flick to my querying tab, OK. We're going to create a view. OK, it's been quite view heavy this session, but essentially, as you can see. Uh, I'll drop the view if it already exists and I'll switch to my uh, Power BI UK. OK. I'll create the view. Would it help if I zoomed in a bit? Yeah. OK. Same syntax as you would as your SQL database, SQL Server dedicated. We're going to create a view. OK. Choose the columns from our source data. But as you can see here, I've added three columns at the bottom. File path function uh, one, two and three. OK, and that's going to return the value or the folder name at that folder hierarchy. OK. And I've also cast them as data types as well. So I've cast uh, the year folder as a small int, the month as a tiny int and the folder event date as a date. OK, and as you can see why we create views is pretty much to abstract this open row set um, syntax away. OK, so I've got my data source. Yeah, so that's my HTTP connection to my data lake. OK, it's the bulk statement here that the file path functions relate to. OK, so as you can see, I've got these. Asterisks for the year, the month and the date. <clears throat> and essentially what serverless will do is replace. Those stars or those asterisks with the value. Of the folder in the data lake. Most importantly, I can use those for filtering and the reason we want to filter is if we only go to the folder that we want we can reduce the amount of data that we're processing okay so we're going to create this view okay and if we do account big we'll probably see something in the region of about 2.4 uh, billion rows. OK. Now, as I previously stated, um, we looked at some CSV data, but this is now Parquet data. OK, so if we have a quick look. At the linked service. Have a look at the data lake. OK. Browse down our folders. And there we go. Dot parquet. OK, so that is the compressed file format. OK, so that 46 meg of data within that parquet file as a CSV, it could it could be 200 meg. Three 500 meg. OK, so that's a you know, that's massively uh, compressing that data. OK. Let's go to Power BI. So. I'll go back to my folder, OK. I'm going to open serverless, but actually. I'll open up desktop from here. Because. Uh, I've got about three versions of Power BI desktop installed. <laughs> OK, and we'll open up. Open the report, browse, and we'll open up serverless. OK. Now this report is connected in. Go to summary. Uh, this report is connected in direct query. Yeah. I've got one for import, which will which I'll show. OK, so as you can see, um, it's running a query and it's going to aggregate the events by day okay and we get the results back in a few seconds now 
One of the things about serverless is, and this is on the Microsoft you know, documentation itself, is it will not give you the performance of an interactive BI engine. OK, it just it just won't. OK, there's overhead in terms of serverless, taking that query, provisioning the resources, running the query, returning the results and providing that back um, to the calling application. There is also the overhead of the storage API as well. Yeah, because essentially serverless is uh, having to call the Azure storage API to traverse folders to understand well what folders are there and uh, where do I need to go to get my data? OK, so there are some steps of overhead there. Yeah, so you're not really going to get that sub second uh, latency. OK, however, we've visualized 2.4 uh, billion rows of data. This isn't aggregate data. That's 2.4 billion rows across all those parquet files. OK. So what I'm going to do is. This report is fine, uh, OK, doesn't really tell me much. Um, I'd like to put some more detail on the report and I'd like to filter. OK, so what I'll do is. I've got two reports, I've got filter, no partition and filter that will become clear when I go through them. OK, so on filter, no partition. I'm using the event date that's actually within the parquet files themselves that exists as a column in one of those files. OK, now you think, well, yeah, if I'm going to filter, I'm just going to use the date that's available to me in those files to filter. OK, the problem with that. Is as we've seen here, there is some latency in terms of it getting the data. OK. What? serverless is doing is it's traversing all of the folders looking through all of those parquet files seeing that column that i'm using to filter and then filtering based on that column but it's having to look through every single parquet file in all of the folders to do that processing yeah as you can see here, it's still going. What I want to do is I actually want to flip back to studio. Look at monitor. And look at these SQL requests, OK? And these SQL requests are what serverless is receiving from Power BI and what serverless is processing. Now look, as you can see, two bits of information are really important here. We've got duration and data processed. OK, so these are the queries that. Power BI are generating. Zoom in a little bit. We can see that some of those queries are processing quite a lot of data and taking quite a bit of time to process as well, because it's got to traverse all the folders, got to look through all the files. You can imagine what it would be like with CSV. OK, but we've got 1.5 gig, 1.96 gig. OK, yeah, we're only paying five dollars for one terabyte of data, but you can imagine a few reports, a lot of filtering. That data processed is going to go up. OK, so we need to help serverless out a little bit. OK, now if we are filtering based on. A value that is actually being used in the folder structure. OK, so data lakes can be structured, you know, in business area, in, um, you know, the, the date that the data was uh, exported or the date the data was generated. We can use that. So I'm just going to refresh. And go back to Power BI. If I go to my filter. OK, what I'm now using. OK, that folder event date. That's the result of the file path operation. So it doesn't actually exist in the parquet file. It's not in those files at all. It's the value of the folder that's being returned by the view. Yeah, so what I'll do is I'll select another date. OK, so I'll open up my filtering. Yeah, so I've got basic filtering, which means that. 
it's running a query to actually go and get the list of folders. Um, you can set this to advanced uh, advanced uh, filtering as well, and it won't do that. OK, so I'm going to go and select, let's say, October. I'll do the 18th. I'll apply. OK. And in a few seconds, we'll get our results back. OK. So if I flick back to studio. Refresh. OK, there we go. We've got some better durations. OK. We're going to. Go into there and there we go. So we've got some 10 megs some 28 megs some 13 megs. As you can see, a lot, lot better than two gig of data process. We got the exact same result back, but we just helped out serverless by passing through. In the filter, the value. Down into that file path function. So if I flick back to um, this report, I'll close that. And the very, very last thing I'll do, okay, I'm not going to save that, okay, is import. Yeah. Now, when we're looking at importing, yeah, there we go. When we're looking at importing data, okay, again, if we're dealing with the volume of rows that we're dealing with in uh, dedicated or serverless, then you know it's going to make sense to do a couple of things. To number one, um, roll that data up to a high level of granularity, um, and or number two, set some kind of incremental refresh on that as well. OK, now with incremental refresh. And this works with hybrid tables as well. So if I look, uh, open up my import. <clears throat> OK, if I transform data. OK. We've got standard incremental refresh um, pattern where we've got two parameters for uh, the range start and the range end, and I've just got two default parameters in there. Um, my data, I'm going to let, uh, let it run the preview. Um, I've set those parameters uh, to be the filters on that event date column, and that event date column is the file path function in serverless SQL pools. OK. And what I can then do is. Set up my incremental refresh. I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit. OK, select my table, which is my web telemetry table. Set my archiving strategy, so I'll go back you know, one year. Uh, set my incremental refresh starting so you know a day and i've selected get the latest data uh, in real time with direct query uh, which is the hybrid tables option then what that will do is when it refreshes it's going to use that column that i've set in the view to return the value of the source folder so it's only going to go to that specific folder in the data lake to get the data that it needs. So for the direct query, if there's some data being streamed into that uh, folder or being moved into that folder during the day, then serverless can serve that data up. But it won't have to like. Iterate and process or filter a whole bunch of other data. OK. We'll go back. To there, OK. So we go back to the slides. OK, so last slide <laughs> is um, 
so the last few few uh, few days, uh, there has been some news of a new uh, new certification, which is very interesting because it combines um, Power BI and Synapse Analytics. So, you know, of particular interest. When I saw this a few days ago, I thought, oh, wow, that's that's really, really good. Um, it also includes some purview stuff for data governance and some data lake Gen 2. But uh, looking through the, uh, the 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 skills required, uh, you can get you can get a real good idea of um, Power BI and Synapse Analytics and how they're going to be working together as well. So yeah, definitely definitely have a look and check that out. And yeah. As I said, I've got some references and I'll post a link to the uh, to the uh, to the to the references afterwards. So there we go. Thank you very much. I honestly hope hope it's been uh, hope it's been you know interesting. And yeah, uh, as I said, um, you know, I'll flick back very, very quickly to the front. Uh, again, that's my uh, Twitter. Um, so, if, you know. If. if a question comes to you, uh, you know, at certain points, or you just want to want to have a chat about it. Please do. But there we go. Thank you, Leon. Excellent. Thank you very much, Andy. Absolutely fantastic session. I'm sure they opened up the eyes uh, to a lot of our community as well that maybe haven't used um, a synapse. I always go to say synapse. Um, uh, it happens to us all. <laughs> I'm, 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 yeah, it's because PowerPoint or, or none of the um, dictation uh, recognizes synapse. Yes. And, and also Azure, it doesn't seem to recognize Azure, so it has to be, I'm trying to get myself to say Azure Synapse, but you know, it's a learning oh, process. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I'm sure that the community, as I mentioned, that previously haven't used uh, this technology as of yet, um, it would have opened their eyes um, to how it can be used and how it can be performant as well uh, within Power BI. So absolutely fantastic session there. Um, and just on that note, I've just popped into uh, the chat for everybody. Um, as always, we have an anonymous feedback form. So please do uh, take 10 to 15 seconds out of your day to provide us with feedback on how we can continue to get a um, excellent content like today's session um, and Microsoft MVP speakers, um, but also tailor our sessions a bit more to your needs as well. But with that being said, as I mentioned, Andy, absolutely fantastic session. So really, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And um, thank you everybody as well for joining us. As always, you could have been anywhere in the world, uh, but you've been here with us at the Microsoft Power BI UK user group, uh, brought to you in association with our sponsors on Next Data. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Stay safe. <laughs>